Myself, Dr. Gibran Amak presents to you Simply Pathology and today we are back with a very important lecture. Today we are going to read about the peripheral blood smear. So this topic is very very important not only for the undergraduates but it is also very important for the postgraduate MD DNP pathology students because uh, knowing about the peripheral blood smear is the most basic thing that you have to know and it is a must for you to pass the MD or DNP practical exams. And one question on the peripheral blood smear is 100% there in your practical exams, both in MD, DNB, as well as in the undergraduate practical exams in MBBS. Okay. So let us see what are the objectives, what are we going to learn in today's topic of discussion. So, first of all, we have to understand that what is a peripheral blood smear and what are the uses? Why are we doing the peripheral blood smear? Secondly, how do you make a peripheral blood smear? Okay, what is the principle? What is the method of staining of the PBS? Okay, you have to know in details about the staining process and what are the stains used. Normally, we are using the Romanovsky stains. Okay, so we are going to read what are the Romanovsky stains? Why are they used for the peripheral blood smear? Okay, what are the features of an ideal peripheral blood smear? How to identify the different blood cells that you see in the peripheral blood smear? how to have a systematic approach to a PBS, okay? So, it is very important, the first year residents as well as the third year residents, okay? It is important for both of you. For the first year residents, you have to develop a plan, a systematic approach, how to study a particular PBS and how to report. That is very important. It is the bread and butter for a pathologist. And for the third year, because you are the, you know, exam going batch, so a lot of questions will be asked from the peripheral blood smear and you have to answer all of them, okay? If you fail in the PBS, then you will fail in your MD DNB exam as well. So this topic, though it is very easy and it is basic topic, but it is a must know topic. Okay, you should know that what are the things that you are going to study under the 10x, under the 40x, under the 100x, okay? And in the end, I am going to show you the normal peripheral blood smear reporting. So, in this particular session, we are only going to understand what are the basics of the peripheral blood smear. Details about the morphological evaluation of the RBCs, morphological evaluation of the WBCs, platelets as well as the parasites. It will be discussed in details in the subsequent lectures. Okay, So, in the first part, we will understand the basics of the peripheral blood smear. So, what is a blood smear and what are its uses? Okay, So, basically if you see a blood smear, it is a specimen for microscopic examination which is prepared by spreading a drop of blood across a glass slide followed by staining with one of the Romanovsky stains. Okay, So, we this is a basic definition of a blood smear. So, what is the use? When is it that you require a blood smear? So, the first very important use when you want to diagnose any kind of anemia or thrombocytopenia. So, for example, there are clinical sign symptoms of anemia. Then the treating physician is going to write down a complete CBC gram or the complete blood count. Okay, So, there they are suspecting anemia. So, for the diagnosis of anemia or for the diagnosis of thrombocytopenia, for example, there is a recurrent bleeding or there is sign symptoms of bleeding like petit chi. Okay ichymosis like that. So, in that situation, okay, you have to get a CBC done. Then for identifying and suggesting the type of leukemia. So, for example, if there is a, there are signs, symptoms of leukemia like fever is there, anemia is there, infections are there, okay, you know, bone pain is there. So, to confirm, you are going to write down a peripheral blood smear, okay. In addition to the CBC, you will write down the PBS, okay. So, wherein the pathologist has to examine the slide and comment on the presence or absence of abnormal cell. In the detection of hemoparasitic infection, so sometimes they are going to write down MPDA, okay. Along with that, they might also write down MP. So, when they are write, writing down just MP, that means a slide has to be made and you have to see these, the, you have to, you know, search for the malarial parasites in the peripheral blood smear. If only the dual antigen test is required, then in that case, you don't have to examine the slide personally. But if MP is written or if a PBS is, writ is written and they're suspecting malaria, then you have to examine the slides for any malarial parasite or any other parasite. Okay. Then to monitor the effect of chemotherapy and radiotherapy on the bone marrow. Okay. Then to detect pre-analytical or analytical error in the output of automated analyzer. So what is very important over here? That for example, suppose if your machine is working nicely or no, whether your machine, for example, you are having a three part or a five part analyzer. So they are going to carry out quality control on that. They are going to run certain controls 
like low control, high control or whatever they are going to run. Okay. So what happens that whatever finding you are getting in the automated analyzer, whether that is matching completely with what you are examining under the microscope in the slide. Okay. So that is very important. So if there is any kind of, if for example, the machine findings are not correlating with the findings that you are finding under the microscope, that, that means something is wrong with the machine or something is wrong with the analyzer. So that means that there is some kind of problem in the machine. So therefore, this diagnosis can be made only in that particular way because whatever you are looking under the PBS, that is completely correct because what you are seeing is what is true. So to find out any discrepancies between the machine finding and between your finding, this is very important. So for quality control to find any pre-analytical or analytical uh, er 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 error, we are doing the PBS as well. Okay. Then to provide direction for further investigation that will help in arriving at the correct diagnosis. Okay, now for example, sometimes you have to uh, do further investigation. So for example, if you are suspecting some kind of infections in a, in a particular per person or you are suspecting some kind of sepsis or something like that, okay, or you are suspecting some drug effect, then in that situation also you are uh, you know, uh, to order, you know, for further investigation and for further confirmation, you are carrying out a PBS, okay. To correlate the instrument flag, instrument flag means what? That for example, your machine has given a platelet count of for example, 15,000. Okay. So in that case, it becomes mandatory for you because when the platelet count is less than 1 lakh. Okay. So routinely in our lab, when the platelet count is less than 1 uh, lakh, then a peripheral blood smear is prepared so that we can confirm whether really the platelet counts are that much less. Similarly, for example, this is about the platelet count. Similarly, for example, if the WBC count is coming around 40,000, okay, it is very high. Or for example, it is coming around even 20,000. So the normal range is around 4,000 to 11,000. So if it is so high, then we have to confirm, okay, why it is so much high, whether it is neutrophilia or whether it is any kind of myeloproliferative or lymphoproliferative disorder. So to rule out any abnormalities, okay, to find out the cause of this increased count, we have to examine the peripheral blood smear slide. So similarly, any kind of instrumental flag, sometimes the instrument cannot give you differential count. They, they, they will just flag it. Okay, so as a result, you have to, or for example, sometimes the mixed percentage is very high. So in that case, you have to examine the particular peripheral blood smear to confirm, uh, you know, those cells and to confirm the nature of those cells to carry out complete differential count. Okay, that is why uh, sometimes to correlate with the instrument flag, sometimes machine is giving some flags, machine is saying that this, you have to check this parameter. In that case, you have to uh, examine that particular parameter under the microscope. And also before examining a bone marrow aspiration slide, you have to do a PBS. So what is very important before you are carrying out a bone marrow study, okay, you always have to see the blood picture. That is the peripheral blood picture. You have to see that is seen with the help of PBS. So these are some of the very practical uses why you are going to make use of a PBS. So you have to make sure in your mind that when a PBS is coming to you, what are the requirements? What is the treating clinician want you want from you? Okay. So blood smear examination is therefore indicated in clinically suspected cases of anemia, thrombocytopenia or hematological malignancies like leukemia, lymphoma, multiple myeloma, disseminated intravascular coagulation in conditions where you suspect parasitic infection, for example, fever with chills is there. Okay. So diurnal with, with diurnal variation of the chills and fever. So you will suspect malaria. So if there's a season of malaria, so absolutely you are going to ask for a MP. Okay, that can be confirmed by examining the peripheral blood smear. Similarly, if you're suspecting any kind of viral infection, so the lymphocyte count will be very high. So in that situation, it is very important to understand. Okay, and, and for further investigations, you are giving the PBS. Okay, and for various other inflammatory and malignant diseases, you are requiring a PBS examination. So these are the basic uses or indications of carrying out a peripheral blood smear. So you should be very swift with your answer. So if your question in your viva is what are the indications of doing a peripheral blood smear? So these are the things that you have to say in your viva as well. Okay. Okay. Then how do you make a peripheral blood smear? So let us try and understand this point. So to prepare a peripheral blood smear, you take a small drop of blood around 2 to 3 millimeter in diameter is placed in the center line about 1 centimeter away from one end of the glass slide. So you can see you have taken one drop over here. You have taken a drop of blood over here. You have taken exactly around 1 centimeter from one of the ends. Okay. The typical uh, size of the glass slide that we are using is 75 into 25 millimeter with a thickness of about 1 millimeter. With a wooden stick or a glass capillary, you are placing the drop of blood in this particular slide. 
Now the slide that you use, it should be clean, dry and grease free. Now the blood sample may be venous blood, okay, that is anticoagulated with EDTS or it can be capillary blood from the finger prick, okay. Remember, for the best blood cell morphology, if you want to study the morphology of a particular uh, uh, cells, okay, it is best uh, to obtain the sample from the finger prick, directly from the skin puncture. So, better blood cell morphology is obtained if the smear is made directly from the skin puncture, okay. If EDTA anticoagulated venous blood is used, the smear should be prepared and stained within two hours of blood collection. If venous blood collected in a syringe is used, the last drop of blood in the needle after withdrawing or the first drop while dispensing should be used for making the peripheral blood smear. So, what you are doing, you are taking one drop with the help of a wooden stick or a glass capillary and you are placing it mainly on the center just one centimeter from one end of a particular glass slide. The standard size of the glass slide is 75 into 25 millimeter uh, and the thickness of approximately one millimeter. Okay. Now, now then you can see this is the glass slide where you are going to have the peripheral blood smear, okay, and you have taken approximately one or two drops of blood over here, okay. Now, you want to spread this blood uniformly across this slide, okay. So, you have to take a spreader slide. So, this slide over here, this slide that you can see, this is the spreader, this is the spreader slide, okay. So, it is a glass slide which should have absolutely smooth edges. Okay, and one or both corners at one end of the slide should be broken off. So, uh, the corners, if you see, they are saying that this corner, if I say you, the corner, this corner and this corner should be broken off. Okay, ideally, usually they do not, but if possible, you should break off the corners. Okay, the spreader slide should be narrower. Okay, they should have a width of, of 15 millimeter, whereas the breadth of the particular PBS slide is 25. Okay, that of the spreader should be around 15 millimeter but it is not always possible okay it is not always possible in day to day activity okay so why is this required because finally whatever you are getting the smear so that the edges of the smear can be examined microscopically okay so what they are trying to say let, let me just tell you if this is a particular glass slide okay and if for example we want a smear to be somewhat like this so that these edges okay these edges can be examined nicely or can be examined carefully that is why they are saying that we should use a spreader the the thickness of which is lesser as compared to that of the peripheral blood slide okay where we are going to make the smear okay so this is very very important but usually this is not always possible this is not always possible in day to day activity this is the ideal situation now, a spreader slide, if you see, it is placed at an angle of 30 degrees in front of the drop. Now, you have to place this spreader is placed. So, for example, this drop is there and the spreader has to be placed in front. It has to be placed in front of the drop, okay, and it is placed at a particular angle. Over here, it can range between 30 to 45. Usually, they are keeping it at an angle of 30 degrees in front of the drop and then it is little bit drawn backward. So, as you are drawing it backward, what is happening? This drop is actually spreading along the line of the spreader. Okay, so it is spreading along the line. So, a spreader slide is placed at an angle of 30 degrees in front of the drop and then drawn back to touch the drop of the blood. The blood spreads across the line of contact of the two slides. So, the blood is now spreading across the line of contact. So, this is how. So, you can see now the blood sample was over here. I have kept the spreader in front. Just I have taken little bit the spreader back. So, once you take back, this entire blood is basically spreading along the line of contact between the two slides. This is the spreader slide and this is the slide in which the PBS is made. So, it is spreading like this, okay. And once it happens, the smear is made by smooth forward movement of the spreader along the slide. So, the smear is now made by smooth forward movement of the spreader along the slide. The whole drop should be used up, up one centimeter before the end of the slide. The length of the smear should be about 3 centimeters. The spreader should not be raised above the slide surface till whole drop of blood is spread out. Okay, So, you have to remember these points very importantly. They are saying over here that when you are spreading it like this, okay, you should spread till the entire blood has been used up. Okay, So, you should take a very less amount, not a very high amount, usually one or two drops. A drop of blood is enough, less than 10 microliter of blood can be taken, okay. And you have to make, okay, just remember if this is a particular slide, the smear should come, okay, at least the a distance of 1 centimeter has to be kept from the end, okay, till which the smear is drawn, okay. So, this was where you have started, 
okay and from here the smear has been made okay so at least one centimeter has to be uh, you know some distance has to be there from the end of the slide okay till the smear is basically ending okay so as you can appreciate over here once the smear is made so you have to rapidly air dry it okay so smear is rapidly dried by waving it in the air or keeping it under an electric fan slow drying will cause shrinking artifact of the red cell so you have to dry it very rapidly okay so again you can see over here that they are again making see already the blood has spread over here and now they are going to make now what we have what we are trying to say that you can appreciate over here in this particular smear that the smear length if you see okay it is not going till the end okay it is ending over here so there is some distance between the end as well as between this particular pbs that is being created over here okay why it is very important because when you are examining under the microscope okay though so the microscope the stage cannot move after further length so if for example your smear is reaching till here you will not be able to examine this area that is why your smear should end at least one centimeter from the end okay okay not only that now the patient's name or the laboratory number and data are written so you can see over here a bar coding has been done for individual slides a bar coding has been done in our country you can just give a particular number with a lead pencil or with a permanent marker pen or a diamond pencil on the thicker end of the smear and always the marking is done at this particular end okay why it is done at this particular end so it is very important to understand because it is at this end that we have to examine so we don't should not write anything over here it should always be written the marking should be done at this particular end that is the head end of the particular pbs slide so i hope you have understood in details that how to make a particular you know peripheral blood smear so how do you make a peripheral blood smear you have to understand in details about that and very very importantly for the post graduate students i am telling again in the exams you are required to make your own slide so you will have to take the sample you will have to make the smear by yourself so it is very important that you start practicing making the peripheral blood smear slide by your own okay and this is the way you should make it ideally because you will be marked on these particular parameters okay now after the smear is particularly you know after it is air dried after the smear has been air dried it is fixed immediately with absolute methyl alcohol which should be moisture and acetone free and the fixation is done for 2 to 3 minutes in a covered jar okay so absolute ethyl alcohol can also be used but not methylated spirit as methylated spirit is containing water so first you have to fix your particular smear so ideally this is the ideal situation okay but usually in day to day practice and routine practice that is not being done why because the stain that we use that is a leishman stain already it is containing methanol which can act as a fixative but apart from that if you are asked about the ideal uh, situation so ideally after you air dry the smear you should fix the smear immediately with absolute methyl alcohol for 2 to 3 minutes okay now why do why are we fi uh, fixating or why is the fixation done the aim of fixation it is to prevent washing off of the smear from the slide so whatever smear you have created over here okay so in the particular slide you have created a smear so if you do not fix it then what is going to happen during the process of staining or something there is a high chance that your smear will you know will 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 uh, come off okay it is going to come off the particular slide so to pre the aim of fixation is to prevent washing off of the smear from the slide following this the color of the smear becomes light brown in color so after you do the fixation the color becomes light brown now this fixation is desirable even when leishman stain is used which contains methyl alcohol as i told you this fixation is required or is desirable the term is desirable it is not a must but it is desirable so this fixation that we are doing with methyl alcohol is desirable even if the leishman stain is used which is also containing methyl alcohol okay so uh, but ideally this is not followed everywhere routinely if you go they are just using leishman stain with a mixture of methyl alcohol why now now why is this uh, you know done this is because leishman stain may have absorbed so you must be thinking that if leishman stain is containing the fixative methyl alcohol then why are we use, are, are we doing fixation separately why is it desirable because over a period of time the leishman stain that you are using may have absorbed moisture that will lead to poor fixation if methanol is contaminated with water it will sh uh, the sharpness of the cell morphology is lost and there is vacuolation of the red cells so that is why it is desirable to carry out fixation separately okay 
Methanol should be the methanol that is used for fixation should be acetone free since acetone washes out the nuclear stain. So why it should be water free? The absolute methyl alcohol should be moisture or water free because if it is not water free, then the fixation will not be proper and the cell morphology is not very crisp or sharp. And why it should not have any acetone? Because if the acetone is there, it is going to wash out nuclear stain. So it should be acetone free and moisture free. Now, in many laboratories, the slide is stained immediately after air drying without prior fixation, and the results are satisfactory. This is what being this this is what is being done in majority of the laboratories. So they are not doing any proper fixation first. So directly after air drying, they are using the Leishman stain, which is containing methyl alcohol. However, if you are suspecting a delay of more than four hours is anticipated between the air drying and staining, the slide should be fixed. Okay. So very importantly, separately fixation is not required if you are if you are going to stain it immediately after air drying. But if you think that some amount of time will be required, then in that situation, you should fix the slide immediately. If not, background gray blue staining of the plasma will occur. So they will take a background stain of gray blue. Okay, gray blue staining of the plasma will occur in the background. Okay, so the first step after air drying, so rapidly you should air dry, then you should carry out fixation. Okay. Ideally, fixation should be done before carrying out Leishman stain. But if you are, not, but if after air drying you are immediately going to stain that particular slide with Leishman stain, then you might skip the step of fixation because the Leishman stain already is containing methyl alcohol. But for ideal situations, uh, absolute methyl alcohol should be used for fixation before going for Leishman staining. Okay, so a well spread blood smear okay if you see what are the ideal characteristics what are the ideal characteristics of a uh, you know well prepared smear so it is tongue shaped with and having a very smooth tail okay it does not cover the entire area of the slide it has both thick as well as thin areas with gradual transition it does not contain any lines or any kind of holes okay so these are very important points okay so this is what an ideal smear should look like so you can appreciate over here this is an unstained this is unstained peripheral blood smear okay you can see there is a lot of distance between the end of this slide and this particular peripheral blood smear you can also see over here how this particular smear is tongue shaped okay it is tongue shaped at one end so how it is tongue shaped we can appreciate this was the drop where we had taken we had taken initially okay then the spreader was taken little little, little bit uh, with back so as a result this drop of blood has spread like this and then after that very gently we have taken smoothly we have drawn a particular smear as we can appreciate over here in this particular slide now you can see very very importantly there is no hole and there is a gradual transition you can see from this thicker area okay this thicker area there's a gradual transition to this thinner area as you can appreciate over here okay also if you see it this particular uh, peripheral blood smear it is not covering the entire area so the entire area is, should not be covered okay as i told you if a smear is going till this length then because the stage of the microscope is limited it will not be able to move the lens till this portion and you will not be able to examine this area now very importantly what is very important the area of interest is always this area the end of the smear okay this is the area which is ideal for examination ideally this area is suitable for examination from here you go inwards for your examination this is the area where the morphology is best observed okay so these are the basic important characteristics of a a smear it is tongue shaped with a smooth tail as we can appreciate it is tongue shaped with a smooth tail over here as you can see it does not cover the entire area of the slide so the entire area of the slide is not covered as you can see only this area of the slide is covered okay it is having both thick and thin area with a gradual transition so this is the thick area and this is the thin area okay and there is a gradual transition from the thick to the thin area okay and they do not contain any lines or holes so there are no lines or hole that you can appreciate over here okay now what are the parts what are the parts of the peripheral blood smear that we are seeing so if you see over here on the left hand side that you can see on the side from where the point from this point we have take, made the smear so this area from where the smear was made this is called as the head this is the head area okay after the head comes the second area that is the body and the third area is your tail area okay 
this is the tail this is the area this is the tail area so there is the head area body area and the tail area okay this is the area this the tail area is the area which is most suitable for morphological evaluation of the blood cells or for examination so the first year residents usually you people make a lot of mistakes okay you directly go and you focus in these areas so this is completely wrong you should focus completely at the tail end okay so you should be very aware what is the head what is the body what is the tail area okay so this is very very important for your exam purpose okay now this is these are all the examples of poorly made slides so if you see over here what are the problems so in this slide if you see it is covering the entire portion also there are some holes over here in this area such a big hole see over here what has happened basically proper fixation wasn't there and as a result the particular slide completely has come off okay you can see over here see th this is not a very smooth slide okay and you can see this area is dark this area is light it shouldn't be like this see this is not a tongue shaped smear this is some other shape okay this is not a tongue shaped smear again over here you can see you can see multiple holes over here and lines again multiple holes and lines can be appreciated again if you see these uh, particular slides they are they are ending abruptly like this they should end very nicely they should end up they should not end abruptly again you can see lines over here okay so these are all the types in which you should not make again if you see this particular smear it is completely starting from here and is going towards the end so you will not be able to examine this area over here okay and also they are basically stopping abruptly they are not completely see this area they are stopping abruptly over here okay so they are stopping abruptly over here so you cannot examine nicely okay again if you see there is no gradual transition okay over here the tail area is darker as compared to the head area as we can appreciate so there, there are holes over here okay so these are exactly the ways in which your you know slides should not be made okay so it should ideally be something like this this is how you should make a particular peripheral blood smear slide i hope this part is clear to everyone okay now as you can appreciate you can tell a lot okay about a patient okay looking at the gross image of particular slides looking at the gross image of a slide you can say clearly what is wrong with a particular patient so if you see all of these are very properly stained uh, not stained sorry all of them are very properly uh, drawn pbs smear but what is very important if you see on the right hand side this particular pbs this is very very light okay so even looking at the pbs grossly you can say whether the hemoglobin is less and the patient might be anemic okay so this kind of slide is reflecting anemia okay whereas on the other hand sometimes you might get a very very dark smear like this okay so for example this is very very dark okay so grossly this is pointing towards polycythemia okay so even just looking at the slide even before microscopic examination you can get a rough idea about what is wrong with the patient this is normal this is a normal slide somewhat looks like this if it is much lighter it is pointing towards anemia if it is very dark it can point towards polycythemia okay now again we are having different kinds of smears also like the thin now the one that i have shown you over here the one that i have shown you over here this particular smear okay that is that i have shown you that is done routinely so this particular peripheral blood smear which is done routinely okay this is called as a thin smear as we can appreciate over here this particular smear is a thin smear as we can appreciate over here okay whereas there is another kind of soft smear that is made which is very thick this is called as a thick smear this is called as a thick smear okay this is an another slide where we have demonstrated the thin and thick this is the thin smear okay and this that you see over here this is the thick smear so you must be thinking what is the use so one of the uses of thin smear or the routine smear is to carry out routine morphological evaluation that we do in the lab that you do on the day to day basis not only that thin smear is also good for the species identification of malaria so it is very important for the species okay so to identify the species okay of malaria whereas thick smear is only required when you want to detect the presence of malaria detection of malaria so why the thick smear is very good for detection so over here you cannot say whether what kind of malarial species is there but you will be able to say what uh, whether malaria uh, or parasite is present or no why because in the thick smear you are having more amount of blood so if more amount of blood is there the chances of of uh, getting or the chances of identifying a malarial parasite will be very high so thick smear is used for malarial detection or parasite detection whereas thin smear is basically used for routine examination and for 
स्पीशीज आइडेंटिफिकेशन ऑफ मलेरिया ओके सो वी कैन से दैट द थिन स्मियर इज मोर स्पेसिफिक फॉर मलेरियल आइडेंटिफिकेशन एंड द थिक स्मियर इज मोर सेंसिटिव फॉर मलेरियल पैरासाइट आइडेंटिफिकेशन ओके नाउ देर इज समथिंग कॉल्ड एज अ वेट प्रिपेरेशन ऑल्डो सो आई एम जस्ट टेलिंग यू डिफरेंट काइंड ऑफ प्रिपेरेशन ओके सो वी नो अबाउट द थिन स्मियर थिक स्मियर we also have what is called as a wet preparation so wet preparation is classically used for detection of microfilaria and trypanosome so what you can appreciate over here okay what is this this is your classical microfilaria that you can appreciate so what is a uh, a wet preparation in a wet preparation a drop of anticoagulated whole blood is placed on a glass slide and it is covered with a cover slip and immediately examined under the microscope so what is happening over here we are not doing the leishman staining over here we are not doing any kind of staining okay we are just and you can see the rbcs they are not stained okay we are directly we are you know in the you know we are directly taking the blood in the glass slide we are covering it with a cover slip and we are examining under the microscope so nothing is done over here so what is the use of wet preparation they are used for detection of motile organisms like your microfilaria or trypanosomes okay now we are going to see so till now what all we have read about we have read about what are the indications so when are you going to you know examine a peripheral blood smear slide number 1 number 2 we have seen that uh, very importantly we have seen that how do you prepare a particular smear what is the correct way of preparing a smear what are the characteristics of a particular smear grossly what kind of information you can get for a, from a particular smear okay we have seen all these things over here and what are the different kinds of preparation that we can see like thick smear thin smear wet preparation now we are going to read about and we have also read about the fixation till now okay so till this step we have read now we want to stain a particular peripheral blood smear so now we are going to see the routine staining of the peripheral blood smear okay so first we are going to see the principle of staining okay what is the principle of staining so first of all the first exam question viva question that is be, that will be asked to you that blood smears are routinely stained by one of the romanovsky stains so leishman stain is a type of a romanovsky stain so what is a romanovsky stain romanovsky stain is a type of a stain which is having two main components it is present in all romanovsky stain they are having one acidic dye or eosin y as well as a basic dye okay basics dye for example oxidized methylene blue or for example azure b these are all basic dyes so they have a mixture of acidic dye and a basic dye the staining properties of romanovsky stains are dependent on the two synthetic dyes one acidic one basic example of acidic uh, is your eosin example of basic dye is methylene blue so the basic or the cationic dye that we see it is positively charged and it binds to the anionic sites and imparts a bluish gray color to the nucleic acid nucleoproteins and the granules of the basophil so the example is methyl blue methylene blue or azure blue these are examples of basic dye and the principle is that it is positively charged so it will bind with the negatively or anionic sites like for example they will give bluish color to the bluish gray color to the nucleic acid nucleoproteins granules of the basophils okay so they are stained mainly by the basic dyes acidic or anionic dyes they are negatively charged and they will bind to cationic sites and they will impart an orange red color to hemoglobin and to eosinophilic granules example of the acidic dye that we see is your eosin y as we can appreciate over here so the first question will be the, your first important question will be that what is leishman stain it is a type of a romanovsky stain what is a romanovsky stain it is a combination of acidic and basic the principle being one basic which is positive will bind to anionic side one acidic dye will bind to the cationic side so what are the examples of romanovsky stain so you have mgg okay jenner's leishman's rights field so these are all examples of romanovsky stain okay remember romanovsky stains they are insoluble in water but they are soluble in methyl alcohol methyl alcohol therefore acts as a solvent as well as a fixative so as i told you if you are carrying out staining with a leishman stain that it is containing both methyl alcohol as uh, and this methyl alcohol is serving both as a solvent for the leishman as well as as a fixative so usually if you are staining with leishman stain routinely you do not require you know as a fixative routinely it is not carried out in any labs but in higher labs in an ideal situation in first world countries they are first carrying out fixation after that they are followed by leishman staining 
but the Leishman staining is also having a fixation part, okay, which is because of the methyl alcohol that is present. Now, Romanovsky stains imparts more colors than just blue as well as red orange, okay. So, the usefulness or the principle of Romanovsky stains lies in their ability to differentially stain the different parts. So, they will stain the cytoplasm with a different color, the cytoplasmic granules with a different color and the nucleus with a different color. So, this ability to, to give impart different colors to different components of a cell okay is the is the basis or the principle of romanovsky stain and which is allowing for differentiation between the different blood component that is the usefulness of the romanovsky stain okay so the usefulness lies in their ability to differentially stain different components of a cell so you have to use this term in the principle okay the staining reaction is ph dependent and these stains they have a tendency towards precipitation and therefore the leishman stain should always be filtered before use else a lot of uh, of you know stain precipitates is going to deposit on the slide and it is going to create a problem for you okay so the leishman stain should always be filtered at least they should be filtered on a weekly basis in very good labs in very high quality labs if you go in, in first world countries they are filtered every day okay this is very very important Okay. Now, we are going to see sometimes you will have excess bluish coloration in a slide. So, excess blue coloration can occur if your smear is very thick or there is a low concentration of eosin and more amount of methylene blue. If the dye used is impure, if you are staining for a very long period of time, then that, that has been prescribed in the protocol. If you are carrying out inadequate washing, if excessive alkaline pH is there for the stain buffer or water, then your particular peripheral blood smear might appear more bluish. Similarly, your slide can become more reddish because of an impure dye or incorrect proportion of dye with excessive amount of, for example, eosin or, and less amount of methylene blue. Or there is an excessive ac acidic pH of the stain buffer or water. Okay, Or there is too short staining time or excessive washing is there. If there are granules of stain precipitate, that is masses of small black dots on smear, the stain needs to be filtered. Okay, sometimes in while you are examining, you will see multiple stain deposit. That means that you have to filter the particular Leishman stain. So a well-stained smear, as we can see, it is pink in color in the thinner portion. So you can see this is the stain. This is your stained thin blood smear, as we can see. So at the tail end, this is the tail end where the slide is thinner, where the PBS is thinner. So at the tail end where the particular smear is thinner, if you see it is pinkish in color. Whereas at the head end, that is this is the, the thicker portion or you can say this is the head end, you can see they are purple blue. They are purple blue in a thicker portion. So after staining, this is how grossly you can say whether your particular smear has been made properly or no and mind it these questions are asked in your exam so just by looking he, the particular examiner will give you a slide and he will tell you whether this staining is proper or no so how you can say that so over there you are not replying anything in the exam so in that case you have to say these points very importantly i am repeating again okay as i already told you that there are that the romanovsky stain that we see okay they are a mixture of two dyes one is your basic dye that is methylene blue. Another is your acidic dye that is your eosin Y. Okay. So the methylene blue. So first I will be speaking about the methylene blue. Methylene blue and azure B, they are the basic cationic dyes and they have affinity for the acidic components of the cells like the nucleic acids or the basophic granules. And also they are imparting a purple violet color to the nuclear chromatin. Okay. They are uh, giving uh, purple violet color to the nuclear chromatin dark blue violet color to the basophilic granules and a deep blue color to the cytoplasm of the lymphocytes so there are three important components and the, and the ways in which they are imparting color a purple violet color to the nuclear chromatin dark blue violet color to the basophilic granules and a deep blue color to the cytoplasm of lymphocytes okay this is about the methylene blue okay now the second important dye is your eosin which is an which is basically an acidic or anionic dye it has affinity for the basic components of the cells like the hemoglobin which is stained pink red by eosin and the granules in the eosinophil which are stained orange red or brick red. Neutrophil granules are also slightly ba uh, basic and they stained violet pink or lilac. Actually, it is very light pink in color okay, or violet pink or lilac in color. okay. So, this is how the staining is done and this is called as differential staining. So, the basic principle of any Romanovsky stain is differential staining. 
and they are having a mixture of acidic and basic dye. So, you have to, uh, you know, say about these points in the exam when you are asked about the principle. Okay. Now, we see what is the method of Leishman staining. Okay. So, we will try to understand the method. So, Leishman stain, it is a Romanovsky stain. So, it is containing two dyes. One is basic, that is methylene blue and one is acidic, that is eosin, which is dissolved in absolute methyl alcohol. Now, this methyl alcohol, it is acting as a major solvent in which the Leishman stain is dissolved. And the absolute methyl alcohol is also acting as a fixative. Okay. Commercially, the Leishman stain powder is available. So, 0.6 gram of Leishman stain powder you take and you have to mix it with water free as well as acetone free absolute methyl alcohol approximately 400 ml. Now, the prepared stain should be kept tightly toppered in a brown colored bottle. So, whatever stain you are preparing, you should keep in a amber or a brown colored bottle and they are stored in a cool dark place at room temperature okay they are stored in the room temperature ideally if you if you ask me whatever leishman uh, stain is, is is made it should be filtered twice okay and after you filter it twice you should keep it in the incubator for seven days before you make the first usage of that because once you keep in the incubator at 37 degree the Leishman stain is properly, uh, you know, ripened. There is a ripening of the Leishman stain which is taking place in the incubator. So, this is a very, very important point. Okay, you should be able to make, if you have made the Leishman stain, then you will remember and recall. Okay, nowadays, ready-made Leishman stain is also uh, available or you can make Leishman stain yourself as well. Okay, I have done both of them. So, I am just sharing my experience with you. So, in whatever way you do, you should always keep it in a dark colored bottle away from sunlight and you should ideally keep them in the incubator at 37 degree and you should keep. Now, the longer you keep it, the better it is. There is better staining, there is better ripening of the Leishman stain. Not only that, uh, not only that, on a weekly basis, you have to filter as well. So, the first time you prepare the Leishman stain, you filter it twice, okay, and then you keep it in the incubator for seven days, okay. Now, exposure to direct sunlight will cause deterioration of the stain. After preparation, the stain should be kept uh, for 3 to 5 days before using it since it will improve the quality of the stain. So, as I told you that once you prepare the stain, it is not used in that time. At least you give one week time and you keep it in the incubator so that a process called ripening occurs. So, the first reagent required is a Leishman stain. The second reagent which is required is a buffered water with a pH of around 6.8. Now, what is the method? How do you carry out Leishman staining? So, you have made, so for example, in your exam, you have been given a particular, you know, uh, blood sample. You take the blood sample, take a drop of blood, you make the proper smear. After that, you air dry it and after you air dry it, you are basically fixing it with methanol for 2 to 3 minutes. Now, usually, I am sure in your colleges, if it is done, then you follow the step. If it is not done, you can omit this step, okay? Basically, we directly cover the entire smear with the Leishman stain for 2 minutes. Okay, for 2 minutes, you cover the smear with Leishman stain. After 2 minutes, you after two minutes you add twice the volume of buffered water, which were having a pH of 6.8 that we have already seen. And you leave it for 5 to 7 minutes. Now, once you add the buffer, you will see a scum of metallic sheen forms on the surface. Now, once it is formed also in the process, maybe after an interval of 30 seconds or 15 seconds, you do air agitation with the help of a dropper. You do air agitation okay, of the mixture with the help of a dropper. Now, wash the stain away in a stream of buffered water. Okay, Tap water can also be used for washing if it is not highly alkaline or highly acidic. Usually, we are using tap water for washing. Okay, You wipe the back of the slide clean. Now, once you have the staining is there, Okay, the back of the slide should be completely clean. Okay, it should be made clean with particular, you know, you can use cotton, uh, you know, uh, wet cotton can be used to basically clean. Else, your back of the slide will be completely bluish and it will not give a very good color. And after that, you set it upright in the draining rack to dry. After that, you mount the slide in a, in a suitable mounting medium that is DPX with a clean and dry cover slip of approximately 25 by 25 millimeter cover slip. Now, I, now on a day to day, on a routine basis, we are not using the cover slip, but for routine steps, we are using these steps. Okay. So, you should be able to do and stain a particular slide very nicely in your exams. Okay. And this will be very, very important for you because you are expected to know everything about the Leishman staining. Now, one important way from where you can learn uh, these methods of staining is to, you know, see the medical technologist in your laboratory. 
so you go to them and you see the way they are staining in that way you will be able to identify how to carry out the process of staining now the very important step now the other important competency over here is to identify the blood cells because once you will be going to the central lab duties you need to identify the blood cells okay so let me just tell you so when you are using a leishman stain okay then the red cells they are pink red or they are deep pink in color the polychromatic cells that is the reticulocytes they are grayish blue in color the neutrophils they have a pale pink cytoplasm with pinkish purple granules or light pink granules or lilac granules the eosinophils they are also pale pink cytoplasm with orange red or they have a brick red granules basophil if you see they have a blue cytoplasm but the important feature is the presence of dark blue violet granules monocytes they are having a grayish blue cytoplasm with cytoplasmic vacuolation and they have very fine reddish granules small lymphocytes they have they are recognized by the presence of a dark blue cytoplasm whereas large lymphocytes if you see they are basically having a little bit pale blue cytoplasm so i'm just writing it over here the large lymphocyte if you see they are having a pale blue cytoplasm and they have more amount of cytoplasm compared to the small lymphocyte and sometimes they contain one or two cytoplasmic granules are there okay the platelets they are purple in color and the nuclei of all the cells are stained purple violet in color so this is how the normal staining occurs with the help of leishman stain and this is a differential staining okay so now one by one we are going to see how the individual components look like so as you can see this particular slide okay so as you see over here can you see the individual rbcs so these are the individual rbcs so if you look at the normal rbcs they are 7 to 8 micrometer in size they are round as we can see and they have a very smooth contour and they stain deep pink at the periphery so at the periphery they are very deep pink in color and they become pale at the center okay there is a central pallor okay the area of the central pallor for a normal for a normal rbc it is one third the diameter of the red cell if this pallor becomes more we call it as hypochromia if it becomes less it will become hyperchromia now the size of the normal red cell corresponds roughly with the size of the nucleus of the small lymphocyte so the normal rbc size so for example if i have drawn a small lymphocyte with a nucleus so the size of this nucleus actually should correspond to the rbc size so the size of the nucleus of the small lymphocyte is same as the is reflecting the size of the normal rbc so you can compare the size of the rbc comparing it with the size of the small lymphocyte the normal red cells they are described as normocytic of normal size normochromic with normal staining intensity that is the hemoglobin content okay okay now the segmented neutrophils so how do you identify the segmented neutrophils over here as you can see the polymorphonuclear neutrophils they are characterized by the presence of two to five lobes over here one two three lobe is there over here one two three lobe is there again okay and these are joined by very thin you can see over here very thin chromatin strands the nuclear chromatin is coarse the cytoplasm if you see it is pale pink it is pale pink in color and they are containing numerous small small dot dot like granules okay what are these? these these purple colored stuff these are the platelets as you can appreciate over here so platelets are purple color okay very very important okay now again over here in this slide what you can appreciate what are these cells that you can see yes these are basically the eosinophil the mature eosinophil they are 15 to 16 micron they are slightly larger as compared to the neutrophil usually they are bi -lobed. so you can see they are having two lobes over here okay not only that they contain numerous bright orange red granules so this presence of these kinds of granules helps in identification of the eosinophils the eosinophilic granules they contain major basic protein that is toxic to many parasites and what is their function it includes anti-helminthic activity and allergic response okay then we have the basophil so the way that you will identify the basophils you can see is the presence of these dark violet color okay dark purple black granules which is obscuring the nucleus this is helping in the identification of basophils so basophils are 9 to 12 micron in size and the cytoplasm is filled with coarse deep purple black granules that obscures the nucleus nuclei is segmented into two to three lobes the basophil granules contain histamine and heparin 
they may have they play a role in allergic and anaphylactic reaction that is immediate variety of hypersensitivity reaction okay now if you look at the monocytes okay ideally if i show you they are the largest white blood cells in the peripheral blood so whenever you see the largest cell in the peripheral blood there is a high chance that is a monocyte now always remember one thing in your book okay in your book the monocytes are always shown somewhat like this having a bean shaped nucleus okay but ideally in the ideal situation it is not that the shape of the nucleus of the monocyte can have several kinds of variation so if you see these are two monocytes the most important distinguishing feature is the presence of the gray grayish blue cytoplasm sometimes they will show vacuolation okay there will be small vacuolations over here as we can appreciate over here so you will find vacuolations over here they have a ground glass appearance if you look at the cytoplasm cytoplasm they are giving a ground glass appearance okay and they have very fine very small dotted azeophilic reddish granules and vacuoles in the cytoplasm okay they are the largest cell now if you see over here the nucleus shape you can see they are kidney shaped but not always sometimes you might have some abnormal shapes like this so the nucleus of the monocytes can have wide variety of shape this is my practical experience okay so monocytes they are the largest white blood cells in the peripheral blood around 15 to 20 microns